For over a century, the phrase made in Germany was not just a label of origin, it was a global religion. It stood for an obsession with precision that bordered on the pathological. It conjured images of the perfect closing thud of a Mercedes door, the silent hum of a Siemens turbine, and the unbreaking reliability of a Bosch drill. The German engineer was the high priest of this religion, a figure of stoic competence who mastered the physical world through calculus and steel. But today, if you look closely at the industrial heartland of the Ruhr Valley or the automotive centers of Stuttgart and Wolfsburg, you will see a terrified realization dawning on the faces of the executives. The religion is dying. The god of mechanics and mechanical perfection has been overthrown by the new god of software, and software intelligence. And the German engineer has forgotten how to pray. We are witnessing a tragedy that business historians will likely call the hardware trap. German engineering reached its zenith in the complex Rube Goldberg-esque world of the internal combustion engine. A modern BMW diesel engine is a miracle of mechanics. It has thousands of moving parts, tolerating explosions 6,000 times a minute, managing heat, pressure, and emissions with micron-level tolerances. Germany spent 100 years perfecting this machine. They became the absolute masters of Spaltmas, the panel gap. In German car culture, the measurement of the gap between the door and the frame is a sacred metric. If it is 3 millimeters here and 3.1 millimeters there, the car is a failure. This obsession created the best cars in the world, until the definition of a car changed. Enter Tesla. When Elon Musk started building cars, German executives laughed. They looked at the early Model S and saw crooked panels, cheap plastic, and paint defects. They said, this is not a car, this is a toy. They missed the point entirely. Tesla wasn't building a better mechanical machine. They were building a computer on wheels. While German engineers were spending billions to shave 2% off the fuel consumption of a diesel piston, Tesla was writing the code for autopilot. While Volkswagen was perfecting the haptic feel of a dashboard button, Tesla was putting a giant iPad in the center console and updating the car's entire personality over the air, OTA, like an iPhone. The result was a brutal wake-up call. The German auto giants realized too late that the value of a vehicle was shifting from the chassis to the code. This sparked the Cariad disaster. Realizing they were behind, Volkswagen created a software unit called Cariad. They hired thousands of engineers. They spent billions of euros. The goal was to build a proprietary operating system, VWOS, to rival Tesla. It failed spectacularly. The launch of the ID3, VW's flagship electric car, was a humiliation. The cars were physically built, but they couldn't be delivered because the software didn't work. Thousands of completed cars sat in parking lots, bricked, waiting for engineers to manually flash the firmware with laptops. The heads of Audi, Porsche, and Bentley were in open revolt because their new models like the electric Macan, were delayed for years because the software division couldn't deliver a stable build. Why? Because you cannot turn a hardware company into a software company by just throwing money at it. The culture is different. German engineering culture. Measure twice, cut once. It must be perfect before it leaves the factory. Change is dangerous. Silicon Valley culture. Move fast and break things. Ship the beta, patch it later, iterate. The German engineer is trained to avoid failure at all costs. In the world of software, if you aren't failing, you aren't learning. This cultural rigidity has rendered the German engineer obsolete by definition. They are the best in the world at solving problems that no longer matter. Who cares about the perfect transmission shift points if the car doesn't have a transmission? Who cares about the durability of a timing belt if the engine is an electric motor with one moving part? The complexity of the 20th century was mechanical. The complexity of the 21st century is digital. And in the digital realm, Germany is a developing nation. This is the Nokia moment. In 2007, Nokia made the best mobile phones in the world. They were indestructible. They had great battery life. They had the best antennas. Then Steve Jobs walked onto a stage with an iPhone. The iPhone had a terrible battery. It dropped calls. It broke if you looked at it wrong. But it had a touchscreen and an app store. It was software defined. Nokia's engineers laughed at the iPhone. It doesn't even have a physical keyboard, they said. It's a toy. Five years later, Nokia was dead. Germany is currently Nokia in 2008. They are still making the best phones with keyboards, diesel, petrol cars, heavy machinery, while the world is moving to the smartphone, EVs, AI, robotics. Herbert Dess, the former CEO of Volkswagen, saw this coming. He explicitly warned his workforce, we could become the next Nokia. He tried to force the company to pivot. He praised Tesla. He demanded faster digitization. What happened? The labor unions and the old guard board members fired him. They chose to shoot the messenger rather than read the message. This obsolescence extends far beyond cars. Look at SAP. It is the only major European tech company. It was founded in 1972. Where are the German AI companies? Where are the German cloud giants? 
the middle stand, the hidden champions, the small and medium manufacturers that form the backbone of the German economy are struggling to digitize. They make world-class valves, pumps, and sensors, but they don't know how to collect the data from those sensors and sell it as a service. They sell the hardware for a one-time fee, while American companies wrap a subscription model around it and capture the recurring revenue. The German engineer sells the razor, the American engineer sells the subscription to the blade. The tragedy is that the German education system is still churning out the wrong kind of talent. The technical universities, TU Munich, TU Berlin, are rigorous. They produce brilliant mechanical engineers who can calculate fluid dynamics in their sleep, but they are not producing enough full-stack developers, AI researchers, or data scientists. And the ones they do produce? They look at the starting salaries at Bosch or Siemens, and then they look at the offers from Google, Palantir, and OpenAI, and they leave. Germany is educating engineers for a world that is fading away, while the architects of the new world are being hired away to California. In the next section, we will dive deeper into the demographic cliff and the crisis of the diploma engineer. We will look at why the average age of a German engineer is dangerously high, why the youth have turned their backs on the hard sciences for comfortable government jobs, and how the rigid, hierarchical nature of German corporate culture drives the most creative minds out of the country before they can fix the problem. If the hardware trap is the technological crisis facing Germany, the demographic cliff is the existential one. You cannot maintain a world-class industrial base without world-class people, and Germany is running out of them at a speed that terrifies labor economists. The German Wirtschaftswunder, economic miracle of the post-war era, was built by a specific generation, the baby boomers. These were men and women born between 1955 and 1969. They were numerous, they were hungry for success, and they flooded into the engineering faculties of the technical universities. Today, that generation is retiring. Over the next 10 years, Germany will lose approximately 13 million workers to retirement. This is a massive brain drain occurring not through emigration, but through aging. When a senior engineer at Siemens retires after 35 years, he doesn't just take his pension, he takes 35 years of tribal knowledge with him. He takes the intuitive understanding of why a certain turbine blade vibrates at a specific frequency. Knowledge that was never written down in a manual. Who replaces him? Statistically, nobody. The replacement rate is broken. There are simply not enough young Germans entering the workforce to fill the empty desks. The cohort of young people entering the market is shrinking, and their preferences have shifted dramatically. This brings us to the public sector drain. In the 1980s, the dream of a top German graduate was to work for Mercedes, BMW, or BASF. They wanted to build things. They wanted to compete globally. Today, surveys of German university graduates show a disturbing trend. The most desired employer is often not a tech company or a car manufacturer. It is the state. Young Germans, traumatized by the endless crises of the Eurozone, the pandemic, and the energy shock, are prioritizing security over opportunity. They want the Beamter status, a special class of civil servant employment that guarantees a job for life, a generous pension, and total immunity from layoffs. Why stress yourself out debugging code at a startup for 60 hours a week when you can work 38 hours a week in the local administration, stamping permits with zero risk of firing? Germany is becoming a nation of administrators, not innovators. The engineering faculties are struggling to fill their seats while the social sciences and humanities are overflowing. This is a cultural shift from doing to discussing. And for those few brilliant minds who do choose engineering, the German corporate environment often crushes their spirit. German corporate culture is famously hierarchical. It is built on Ordnung, order and process. In a traditional German concern, a conglomerate, a junior engineer does not simply have an idea and build a prototype. He has to write a proposal. Then he has to get approval from his team lead, then the department head, then the division head, then the works council, Betriebsrat, has to agree. By the time the idea is approved, six months have passed and a startup in Shenzhen or San Francisco has already launched the product. This bureaucracy is toxic to the modern agile engineering mindset. The best young engineers want autonomy. They want to make an impact. When they hit the concrete ceiling of German middle management, they look for the exit. This leads to the foreign talent paradox. The German government knows it needs immigrants to fill the gap. They passed the Skilled Immigration Act to make it easier for Indian, Brazilian, and Vietnamese engineers to come to Germany. But it isn't working as planned. Why? Because Germany is a difficult place to be a high-skilled foreigner. First, the language barrier. Engineering in Germany is still largely done in German. If you are a Python wizard from Bangalore, you probably speak perfect English. But if you have to conduct a safety audit in technical German, technisches Deutsch, you are lost. Second, the tax wedge. Germany has the second highest tax burden on labor in the OECD. The middle stand, the hidden champions, are hit the hardest. 
These are often family-owned companies located in small rural towns in Swabia or Sauerland. They make the best screws, pumps, spot art, and lasers in the world. But try convincing a 24-year-old AI specialist from Shanghai to move to a village of 5,000 people in rural Germany where the internet is slow, the shops close at 6 p.m., and the locals are suspicious of outsiders. It is an impossible sell. So the middle stand is slowly suffocating. They have the orders, but they don't have the people to fulfill them. They are being forced to automate or offshore, not because they want to, but because the local talent pool has evaporated. The crisis of the German engineer is a crisis of the German identity. If Germany cannot build the best machines, and it cannot write the best software, and it cannot attract the best people, what is it? It risks becoming an industrial museum, a place where tourists come to see how cars used to be made. In the final section, we will look at the energy cost crisis that is the final nail in the coffin. We will explain how the loss of cheap Russian gas has made heavy engineering economically unviable in Germany, forcing companies like BASF to dismantle their plants and ship them to China, effectively ending the era of German industrial dominance. If technology is the brain of German industry and people are the muscle, then energy is the blood. And right now, the patient is bleeding out. The final nail in the coffin for the German engineer is not a lack of coding skills or a shortage of graduates. It is the brutal reality of physics and economics. For 50 years, the German industrial model relied on a secret weapon, cheap Russian gas. Pipelines like Nord Stream 1 and 2 were the umbilical cords that fed the chemical giants, the steel mills and the aluminum smelters. German engineers could build world-beating machinery because their input costs were artificially low. They had a competitive advantage baked into the geography of pipelines. In 2022, that advantage vanished overnight. When the gas stopped flowing, German industry was exposed to the harsh winds of the global energy market. They had to switch to liquefied natural gas, LNG, from the US and Qatar. LNG is inherently expensive. You have to cool gas to 160 degrees Celsius, put it on a ship, sail it across an ocean, and turn it back into gas. The result? German industrial electricity prices are now roughly triple those in the United States or China. This breaks the fundamental math of made in Germany. You cannot be a high-wage, high-energy cost country and survive in global manufacturing. You can be high-wage if energy is cheap, the old German model. You can be high-energy cost if wages are low, some developing nations. But being high in both is a death sentence. It means that for energy-intensive industries, the very foundation of German engineering prowess, production in Germany is no longer economically viable. Take BASF, the chemical colossus, the chemical O. Their Ludwigshafen site is the largest integrated chemical complex in the world. It is a marvel of engineering efficiency. But in 2023, BASF announced it was permanently shutting down ammonia and fertilizer plants in Ludwigshafen. Why? Because ammonia is made from natural gas. If gas is expensive, the ammonia costs more to make than the market price. BASF isn't stopping production. They are moving it. They are building a $10 billion Verbund site in Zhangjiang, China. This is the great deindustrialization. It is not a temporary pause, it is a structural relocation. When BASF leaves, the ecosystem dies. The hundreds of small middle stand companies that supply valves, pipes, and sensors to BASF lose their biggest customer. The engineering firms that service the plant lose their contracts. The knowledge base evaporates. This energy shock exposes the dirty secret of the green transition, energy vende. Germany shut down its nuclear power plants, Isar 2, Emsland, Neckar Westheim, in April 2023, right in the middle of the energy crisis. They voluntarily decapitated their reliable baseload power. Now, the grid is unstable. Companies complain about micro outages, milliseconds of power loss that are irrelevant for a light bulb but catastrophic for a high precision CNC machine or a silicon wafer factory. If you are a German engineer trying to manufacture microchips, which requires 24 seven perfect stability, you cannot trust the German grid anymore. You look at France, nuclear, or the US, cheap gas, and you move your factory there. This is why Intel demanded massive subsidies to build a chip plant in Magdeburg. Without government billions to offset the energy costs, the project made no financial sense. And what about the auto industry, the crown jewel? The energy crisis hits them twice. First, in the cost of production, making steel and aluminum requires massive energy. Second, in the cost of ownership for the customer. Germany bet the farm on electric vehicles. But in a country with the highest electricity prices in Europe, charging an EV is becoming almost as expensive as filling a gas tank. The domestic market for EVs in Germany collapsed in 2024 after subsidies were removed. If the German consumer isn't buying EVs, the German car makers lose their home lab. 
They are forced to design cars primarily for the Chinese market, which has different tastes and requirements. Slowly, Volkswagen, BMW, and Mercedes are becoming Chinese companies with German headquarters. They do their R&D in Beijing, they build their batteries in Fujian, they sell their cars in Shanghai. The German engineer in Wolfsburg becomes a legacy cost, a heritage act. So is there a way back? Optimists point to hydrogen. They say Germany will build a hydrogen economy to replace Russian gas, but the laws of physics are stubborn. Green hydrogen is incredibly inefficient to produce. You need massive amounts of renewable energy to split water. Germany doesn't have enough sun or wind to do it at scale. They would have to import the hydrogen from Africa or the Middle East. This just replaces one dependency, Russian gas, with another, Namibian, Saudi hydrogen. And the cost will still be higher than in the US, where hydrogen can be made cheaply from natural gas. The verdict is grim. The German model was a three-legged stool. One, leading technology, combustion engine. Two, skilled workforce, baby boomers. Three, cheap energy, Russian gas. All three legs have been kicked out simultaneously. Technology has moved to software. The workforce is retiring. The cheap energy is gone forever. Germany is not going to disappear. It will remain a rich country for a long time, living off the accumulated wealth of the last century. But it will likely become a museum economy, a place where rich tourists come to see the castles and buy luxury goods, but where the engine of global innovation has gone silent. The German engineer, once the architect of the modern world, is becoming a curator of the past. The future is being built elsewhere. We've watched a government destroy its own industrial base through bad policy, but usually, when a government gets desperate for money to patch the holes in a sinking economy, they don't just tax income, they seize assets. In 1933, the United States government made a policy mistake. They ran out of money, so they came for the people's gold. Franklin D. Roosevelt signed Executive Order 6102, creating a dragnet that forced every citizen to hand over their gold or face 10 years in prison. In the next video, we are going to tell the true story of the great gold seizure. We will uncover the secret prosecutions, the loopholes the wealthy used to escape, and the terrifying legal precedent that allows the president to seize your Bitcoin, gold, and 401k during a national emergency today. You need to know if your wealth is actually yours. Smash that like button to join the resistance and subscribe so you don't miss the history of the gold ban. I'll see you in the vault.